Well, I'm going to say for the AA people, Paul Alcoholic, and uh, we're going to do a little take on the fourth step workshop. And one thing I'd love to get across, if at all possible, is to at least hold the idea that that which is driving you crazy is foreign to you. Like a parasitical movement or a foreign installment, yeah? Because humbly, in my view, the root of the problem in this whole seeming condition, but in, in recovery is we're, we're in an activity, a mental activity, a verb of the mental activity, which is the act of being identified as a self. You have not, be, have not been and you never will be a self, but we can be in that act of being identified as a self. You see it? It's beautiful in a way. It's a verb. So most people would say the act of being identified is the verb and then of self is the noun. But in this thing, it's a whole verb. Yeah? And if you and I are entertaining that verb, the act of being identified as a self, you will have a vague sense that you are a self a long-lasting, independent, separate entity, a thing. And not only that, that you're the doer of stuff that you have nothing to do with. So you're like the doer of the thinking, you're the thinker, you're the feeler, you're the taster, you're the toucher, you're the hearer, you're the seer. You have the problems, you're not the problems, such like that. So this act of being identified as a self is pretty much on offer most of the time that you're conscious. The mental state is assuming, implying it, referring everything back to it uh, all day. And I noticed that the biggest dilemma that, and there's this program, you know, in a few years, there's going to be an AA program for spiritual seeking. Yeah? It hasn't happened yet because at these meetings where there's involved with a lot of mental states trying to seek a solution to the mental state as a mental state, we don't have interventions. No one's going to come up to you at a spiritual meeting and go, you've had enough. You know? <laughs> put, put the book down. Put the prayer beads down. Come on. You've got to go. There is it. And it will go on and on and on. But it's quite similar to the addiction of alcohol and drugs. Because it's based on the pre same pre premise. You are something that you're so assured of, and then you're trying to get relief for that thing when the relief is from that thing. See, if the act of being identified as a self is the bondage, then self cannot get out of self. Yeah? Just like in the statement right before we do the inventory, in the third step where it says we have the main principle of AA, which is to surrender your, your life and will to the care of a higher power, it says first off though, you gotta quit playing God. Yeah? Now, it's going to be very difficult for that which is playing God to quit playing God. When it tries to quit playing God, that's playing God. So this is the dilemma, and it will go on ad infinitum. The thing will quit, want to quit playing God, that's playing God. Then we'll, da, 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 da. You can't get out of self. Self can't get out of self. That's the whole point. And my, the relief that finally stabilized in recovery for me was when I saw self as a foreign installment, because this is what happened. If you keep seeing life from that self, then the, maybe you have an urge to be free, but then that freedom is co-opted, and now you're going to try to be free as the self. That's what defeats us. So, and then in a way, a statement in AA makes total sense then, where it says you are the problem. If you were the problem and are the problem, then there would be no solution. But if the problem that you are is an act of being identified as something that you're not, then you're also the solution. If you see that you're not that which you're identified as, then you become the solution. Because it's the, the solution and the problem is the same event. <laughs> In one event, the solution is taking itself to be the problem, and the other event, the solution is taking itself to be the solution. That's the difference. Yeah. So this is what happened with me around the ninth year, eleventh year. Since I was three years sober, I'm like twenty-nine years sober now. And you know, when I use I and this and that, don't worry. It's you know, people they're like, 
non-dual Pharisees. You know? They, they want to have the letter of the law perfect, but they miss the spirit of it. So you don't have to change the language, just don't take it seriously. So it was about, I had been giving these fourth set workshops, world renowned by the way, in San Francisco from the third year sobriety. And so every Monday, if I was in America, I was leading this workshop and I went through how it works like every freaking Monday for nine to 16 years. And so I had read this statement many, many times, but this time I read it, something had happened to me and I saw this statement completely different. And it's this one, it's on page 64, right before you enter the activity of the inventory, right before you get to resentment. And it goes, being convinced, and convinced means to believe with certainty, yeah? And the only way you're really convinced is in what we call in AA the innermost, like when it says you have to admit to your innermost self, because I admitted I was an alcoholic to get another drink. I admitted I was a drug addict to get another bag. I mean, this is never going to get convinced because it's a two-sided coin. It can be thoroughly convinced and five minutes later be completely unconvinced. Yeah? And no matter how many times you cut the coin, there's still going to be two sides to it. So something has to be, the communication has to go some other place than this like mitt that catches everything. It has to get in and then something can really occur. So it goes, being convinced that self self, yes, this long, this sense of being the doer, the haver, the long-lasting, independent, separate entity, the sense of being you, yeah, that sense of self manifested in various ways is what had defeated us. So here, we're the us, yeah, and then there's a foreign installment or some kind of movement called self, a mental one, in fact, and that self, let's say that parasite captures all the hosts, and drives them to some very familiar places. Yeah? For me, if you took a lot of us in this room and you did a sociological study and all the difference, differences like ethnicity and everything like that could be highlighted, but then all of us usually will end up at the same three parking spaces, institution, jails, and death. You gotta see there's a fleet of us and there's the one driver and it has a fucking key to all the cars. So it's really basically using us for transportation because alcoholism can't drink. It doesn't have a mouth, yeah? Its fuel has to be transferred through this to get to it, yeah? It loves drama, it loves excitement that's really fucking boring, all this stuff. But that's what's happening. It's using us to have a life, in a sense. So when I saw it as something foreign to me, a possibility at that, till that point that wasn't available became suddenly available, which is I can be free from it. Because my true desire to be free had been handcuffed by the identification. I could only entertain being free as it, or for it, or through it, or by it, when the real freedom is from it. Yeah. When you see it as not you, the possibility of being free from it dawns. And I entertained it, or it entertained me, really, and for a long, long time now, I've had <coughs> radical, stabilized relief. I call it traveling lighter. It didn't change the geography of my life, but whatever I'm meant to go through, I've gone through it lighter. What more do you want, really? So, when I share my view of the fourth step, I am never, and see, this is the trip. It is being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us, if we're convinced of that, we consider its common manifestations. It's self, not us. It's, yeah? And then the next paragraph, it's resentment. Resentment is an expression or a manifestation of self in one's life. Then why the hell do we keep calling them ours? Why do we keep calling the fear that's being produced by a, a, a very small-sighted way of seeing yeah? Why do we keep calling the manifestations or the expressions of self ours? We must be in the act of being identified as that. Or you would see fear as fear, not yours. You would see a resentment as a resentment, not yours.
And most of us are passing the same mistake on to other people that will live from the same mistake. We aren't getting to exact nature of the wrong because the exact nature of the wrong humbly from this is not obsession with self. I think the obsession with self is used to reinforce the identification as the one who's obsessed. That's to me is the truth. You can get rid of tons of obsessions, but you can't get rid of the one who's having the obsessions. That's the biggest obsession. So I took, then when this light went on, when I did a, a fourth step, the amount of data and information could have been the exact same as the one I did of three years before, but how it was collated was totally different. I mean, the, 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 the diagnosis was completely different when I saw it as a foreign installment. We have the experience all day. We're just not taking it far. We go to AA meetings. You know, I came into recovery with a thick shell of terminal uniqueness. I mean, no one thought like I did. No one felt like I did. No one did the heinous things that I did. And I go to meetings, and in our meetings of recovery, we talk about what we did, what we thought, how we felt. And after a few months, I could only come to two conclusions. How, could, how did these people get my thoughts? Or they're not my thoughts. And when I entertained the thoughts as not mine, suddenly relief was available. Yeah? Because the relief isn't it from the thoughts, it's from the thinker. That's where the relief lies. You realize you're not the thinker of the thoughts. You disown the thoughts, just like if you were in a park and you had kids and there was 30 kids playing in a park, your attention would go to what you would call your kids more than the 27 other. This is the exact same thing. The idea of being identified as the doer of the thoughts binds you to the thoughts because they're yours. Where you have an immunity to Stanley's thoughts when you see them as Stanley's, the same thoughts happening where you seem to be held as yours can destroy your day. It's not the thoughts. The thoughts facilitate something. The parasite is using the thoughts through the bridge of my to give you its view of life. You lose the living aspect of it and you get an interpretation of it. So instead, like when we were kids, life was happening. It's really cool. But then as the mental state develops, it turns into an interpretation. Life's happening to me. There you go. That's the myopic view. And it's going to cause irritability, restlessness, and discontent. And the parasite is very, very willing to give you an answer, which is drink something, shoot something up, sleep with your friend's wife or whatever. It wants to get things cooking because it thrives there. <laughs> it finds the greatest disguise right in the open because if... If we saw it as something else, let's say there was one motherfucker, hostile parasite, that had like 80 teeth and talons and everything, and it landed on you, you would knock it off like as fast as, as true. You know, if it did it a hundred times, you wouldn't go, oh, come in, you'd be knocking it off. This is what alcoholism is like, and it knows it, so it's found the greatest strategy. It convinces the host that it's the host. So when it appears, you call it me. <clears throat> that's the bondage of self you would never have taken the shit that you quote unquote have given you if anyone else ever fucking tried to give it to you <laughs> <laughs> you put up with you because it's you for 40 years you wouldn't put up with this shit for half a day <laughs> it's not the shit it's the, the cherishing of that sense of self you think everything is all about you and you're willing to take the heavy blows just to be the star of the bad movie. <laughs> would you go back five years ago, if you weren't Stanley, would you go back five years ago and ruminate about an event Stanley was involved with as if it would have changed his life if it would went another way? You're not going to freaking do that. But you've been doing it with you for 40 years. I mean, we never seem to get bored with us, but we're bored stiff with others. <laughs> the show sucks. It's the audience that makes it good. Really, the show sucks. It's the same old, same old. 
If you saw it as something other than you, you'd turn it off, if you could. In this case, how it's turned off is you lose interest in listening to it. You're going to hear it because you're awake, but you're not going to listen to it because it's not about you, which makes you what? Available. And what does availability imply? Presence, yes? And what is something that's present and always available? It's of service. Without any thought or effort. Yeah, it's just the way it is. So, if this, humbly, if this point is missed, you're going to be looking from its effects. You'll be in that bondage of self trying to get out of self. And it's not going to be a point where that rule is exempt. Self trying to get out of self, trying to get, is going to go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. If you see what you're not, you'll find out what you are. And what you are is not a thing, it's not a historical figure, it's not the thinker, it's not the feeler, it's not the doer, it's seeing, it's awareness, it's spirit, bright and beautiful and clear and totally empty, as always. Yeah, all of us are right in it, that what's looking out of your head is what's looking out of this head. There's never ever any difference, no one's better or worse. It's like if you were, um, if this world only had one way to contact it, one sense, let's say touch, yeah? And in this world there was a scripture about what would be the heaven of touching. And the heaven of touching would be rolling into a giant vast ocean of rose petals. And then the softness would be beyond a hundred babies' asses, you know? And, then, and you read this and you, and you hope it's true, yeah? But there's one dilemma. There's a big freaking glove over your hand, and you don't know it's a glove. You think it's you. So everything you touch is a very crude, rough glove. So everything you touch is interpreted through this crude roughness. Yeah. So you never get the real example. The nev you never get the hit of what heaven's really like. All you got is a fucking conceptual idea of it because the petals feel rough. Yeah. And because the glove is moving, you think it has life, but it's the hands that's giving it its life. And right now, the hand can't remove itself because it's never entertained the possibility it could because it's so damn sure it's the glove, it never even questions anything. It just puts up with it. And so now it's a real believer in heaven, but it has no sense feltness of heaven. There's no real, there's no real relief. You're just playing a game of ping pong. You once had relief, and you're hoping you will have relief, but the basic condition is agitated, irritable, and restless. This is, forget all that. If the glove came off and you felt the rose petal, you wouldn't need a scripture about the rose, rose petals. You'd have a sense of it. That sense would speak more than a million words could ever imply. The problem, there's a sample on page 84, and all, the, all those beautiful things in the big book are just expressions of a change. You did not promote the change, you've been changed. That's what the program does. The program isn't a way to change yourself. You submit to the program and you're changed. You come under a greater influence than the mental state and the effects will show. It's sort of like a rose bush that's never bloomed its whole life. So of course, if it was self-centered, it'd feel very, very low self-esteem, sees all the other rose bushes blooming away, it fucking hates them. I wish I could bloom like them and then you want to kill them because you can't. And all you need to do is just take it out of that freaking small pot, put it in some light, give it some water, and it will bloom. The potentiality has never gone anywhere. It's just the environment that's causing it not to entertain it. Yeah. And this environment we're talking about is the environment of possibilities. Yeah. If you, can, if you get a free sample and a taste of it, you can picture the whole meal. So that's the whole driving point of these talks, because I've seen the relief it's brought about through this life, and I've also seen a lot of the members of the tribe I'm in that seem not to be able to have a stabilized relief, because they're so busy looking for it, they don't realize what's looking is the problem. So, all right, so here, so if you go, if you follow this logic, that we're really going to do an inventory on the manifestations of self in one life. 
Yeah? So we're going to actually go over an inventory of a tyranny that we've all lived under that is not us. Yeah? It masquerades as us, and that's how the tyranny continues, but it's not us. Nor was it ever us, nor will it ever be us. Yeah? It's like that story where the lady finds a snake and it's in trouble, so she, she heals, she brings it home, puts it in like a shoebox with a little comforter, gets like an eyedropper, feeds it, and pets it, and loves it, and then one day the snake bites her, and she's really amazed. Mr. Snake, why did you bite me? I've been so nice to you. And he says, hey, I'm a snake. You're not going to train a parasite. It doesn't have a life. You offer it. It's going to take it. <laughs> Simple as that. You're not going to tithe to it or convince it to be better. Look at what people's idea of success is here. Maybe I won't flip out at the next picnic. or Maybe I'll have a three-month-long relationship. I mean, we're shooting pretty low. Yeah? <laughs> we're really jipping ourselves completely. <laughs> so here... Follow the logic. You tell me if it could mean anything other than what I'm going to say. Being convinced, that self, bing, yeah, here itself, manifested in various ways, has defeated us. We're here. Never the two shall meet. Yeah? Self and us. If we're convinced of that, let's look at its common manifestation. Lo and behold, which is the one? Resentment. So how can from that sentence a resentment turn into yours? Because it's clearly been noted, it's an expression or a manifestation of self in one's life. Not your manifestation, but self's manifestation. Then why in hell do we keep claiming self's manifestations as ours? We must seemingly be in the act of being identified as the self. And we're mistaking its tendencies as our tendencies. And it has such a stubbornness that even with... At, all evidence of our, our commonality concerning this, we will still never go and make the leap where when you hear, everyone has my thoughts, everyone has my feelings, everyone's done what I did, and yes, what, what would that lead to? Oop, it gets, sucks you back in, and then you're in the terminal uniqueness. And now it's not our alcoholism, it's my alcoholism. It's your precious little alcoholism. And the mental state is going to use it for excuses, rationalizations, Blame everything. It's gonna once you give it over, why wouldn't it? That's what parasites do. If you if you're off your arm, the wrist of the vampire, it's gonna suck it. How could you be surprised? All right. So resentment, number one offender, kills it more than things than anything else. Yeah. What does the word resentment mean? It means to refeel. So basically, you're basically whatever's happening now is just being submitted back to a feeling you thought you had in the past. What is that but an interpretation? You're not even responding to what's happening. As soon as you see this happening, you react to it as a past event. That's called being out to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> like if you're right now tonight flipping out, it has nothing to do right now. It always has to do with last week or next week. You're not really responding to this moment. And it's not just a one of a moment type. That's a habit now. You're pretty much out to lunch because the head, and this, this thing, the head totally, totally made up two places. It's like the south side of this imaginary place is the past, and then the north side is the future. But basically, all it is is about remembering you as a body in the past and the future. So why? So that you'll remember yourself as a body now. Because being a body isn't natural. It has to be remembered. If you didn't have a mirror, if you hadn't looked at yourself coming over here in every fucking sh store window <laughs> to get a reflection of yourself as a body, it would be quite easy if you were doing something you like to lose any sense of being a body. You'd be totally engaged, yeah? Completely with what was happening. But then, if you got an image, picture, then you'd be telling the story, I was engaged. I, as the body, was engaged. I was the one that did it. But in fact, that's, that's contrived, that's made up, that's learned. So when what's not happening, anything can happen. Yeah. 
you can have cancer in what's not happening. The cancer will be had two weeks from now, but you will feel as if you have it now. Yeah? You, anything can happen. Anything that your head can come up with, if you are ardently a devotee of the thought system, you are going to produce so much freaking anxiety that it's going to be overwhelming, and you're going to have to do something about it. Yet there's nothing you can do because it's not happening. <laughs> there's no solution to an imaginary problem other than seeing it's imaginary. That's the only solution there is. And how much time would it take to, for that to happen? No time whatsoever. <clears throat> when, when's it available now? Will it be available tomorrow? That will be now too. Here, wherever you are is here. Am I, is it going to be available here tomorrow? Yes, it will be. I put it to the test. I've seen the beast. I've seen that, the parasite. There isn't any. It's an activity. And you're actually behind the mask. You're believing it. You have, remember the acronym? Did I say the false evidence appearing real? I don't know. I've been talking so much. It's mixing, I'm mixed up. But false evidence, very famous acronym in recovery. Yeah. False evidence appears real. Fear. All right, now look at that one. False evidence appears real. How could that possibly happen? How could false evidence appear real? It would have to appear real to what's real. Where, where else, what else would lend it reality other than reality? Isn't that the case? So basically here is framed as a seemingly so. It's appearing to be true or false to you. Not based on what you're seeing's condition, but based on your condition. Yeah? So if you're seemingly not in a good condition, or you're in the condition of believing the act of being identified as self, then false evidence will appear to be real to you. And so it will be. As Jesus says, as you believe, so it is. Well, in that moment, it's true. Yeah, but is it true? No, it's false evidence. You're powerful, man, and you don't want, do not want your mental state to be directing that power because it can make exquisite hells out of nothing. Mm -hmm. We are miracle workers every day. You know, at least when Jesus supposedly rose Lazarus up from the dead, he had been alive. We're making shit out of nothing all day. I know friends who have eight earth-shattering events in a week, and nothing gets shattered except their own condition. Watch it. Watch what's leading you. How long will it let you enjoy a miracle? 10, 15 minutes? What happens when it has a sense that it's getting bummed out? It's it forecasts a lifelong depression. Do you want that to be the theme setter of your life? It will shrink what's good and elongate the possibility of what's bad. You want that every day? You're going to fucking drink sooner or later. You're going to act out. You'll have to to get relief. Because you can't get relief from an imaginary problem. Because you're the one who's imagining the problem. So you get drunk. You ch it changes something. But what happens? You wake up and there you are. Yeah? Your power is being misdirected by the mental state. And you're at its own effect. If you surrender your willing life over to care of something else, a higher power will direct that. It takes the same information, but you see things differently. Like in the Course in Miracles, they call it the Holy Spirit. In AA, we call it higher power. You turn over the care of, you know, your will and your life over to it, and then it collates the information differently. And I know what AA did with me. What I call totally useless, it's put great value out of it. It's the greatest recycler of all. What I thought was a wasted life has become an incredible, valuable uh, way of communicating to other sufferers. Mind-boggling. It'll use anything that's given over to it. Just the same way as the mental state does, but the fruit are totally different from the different trees. So, we look at some of the common manifestations. There's lots of them. If you want to look, go to the dictionary and look up self. They're usually followed by a hyphen, and then they have about 130 different attributes. And I'd say the average is about 80 on the negative side, 20 maybe on the, and I'm giving it liberal, 20 on the positive side. That's what you're up against, basically. If that, you know, there's self-immulation, self-destruction, self-self, then there's a little self-love, self-esteem, but then it's 
<laughs> self Armageddon, self, self, self. You have to see. You have to see the connection to what's after on the hyphen to what's before. They're of the same interpretation. The destruction is of self. Yeah, it comes from self. Bondage is coming of self. If you if you lose the influence of self, then the possibility of bondage disintegrates. Get to the exact nature of the wrong, and I humbly believe it's act of being identified as a self. And the beautiful thing, it never actually happened. It can only seem to happen when you're listening to the act of being identified as a self. When you're believing that, the whole freaking thing kicks in. If you don't believe it, there's a big, big, big space called pause. <laughs> <laughs> And you can live from there. You can. It's not a place you visit. It's inherently your own condition. You are a pause. You are not a thing. You are not a mental activity. You're the seeing of everything. Seeing, not eye vision. I mean seeing, aware. So we just do those three. Do I have to go through the four columns? Yeah, it doesn't matter. I'll do a quick one. So there's resentment, fears, and harm other people. And just look at that. We look at our sexual behavior. Yeah, those are the three... And these are introductory inventories. If you're interested in inventory, go to the 12 and 12. There's much more extensive questioning. Yeah, but at this point, we're just trying to get a, a little bit of relief so that the, the process can t continue, yes? Because if you look at the third step, the third step, if it was our life, it would have ended at the third step. It would have just said, hey, turn your life over to the care of a higher power. Okay, great. But see, our life isn't in our hands right now. We've been taken over by the parasite. It's basically the parasite's life. So we cannot complete the third step. We have to make a decision for the third step to be completed. And how that decision is, is given life and breath is through four through nine. You do the action steps, and those action steps diminish the mental hold of you so that a spiritual possibility will become available, a psychic change, whatever how you want to call it. Yes? So when we, like in my head, what my idea of surrender would be like, I'm on a cliff, you know, with a beautiful like sunset and I have girlfriends and ex-girlfriends looking at me adoringly, got long hair, my hair's blowing and I make a decision. Yes, I'm going to turn my one life. No, it says go home and start an inventory. It does not sound as romantic as I thought it would be. You got to go home and what? Take a look at how self-defeated you. They're not your fears. They're not your fears. If they keep being yours, they will persist as long as you persist. Yeah? They will have a long-lasting life, the one that you think you have. You will have, so, you'll have fears that have never seemed to have gone because you don't recognize when they came in. You've forgotten who you are and you've taken yourself to be that which it's implying. And there's no way out if you believe you're in. There's no way out. No way out. So you do the, we do four columns, yeah? Some people say there's only three columns in a book, but if you read the, how it works, it says, referring back to the list again, we ask ourselves, where will we selfish, self-seeking find? That's the fourth column. So there are four columns. So you do the first column, resentment, like who you're mad at. And you know, every bar tonight in Brooklyn, most of the people there are doing the first two columns. <laughs> they know who they're mad at and why. Yeah, they do. And why does it lead to another drink? So what AA does is just move the thing a little bit, but it produces a lot of change, which is what was your role in things? Yeah. So it moves it to, through the four, two, two more columns, and then there's relief when there wasn't any relief after the second column. So the first one is who am I mad at? Second is why. You know? So let's say Wendy. Wendy was a girl that I used to go out with, and she left me. So I'm mad at Wendy, why she left me. And so then we look, the third column is based on the idea of having an instinctual agenda. Like we all have, because the body is, is, is the reference, we need shelter, food, stuff like that. We need socialness, pride, self-esteem. And the self is hovering above it, being the manager of it. So the self is going to try to complete the missions to get what you want, to get what you need. But of course, it's turned a lot of needs into wants, yeah? 
So instead of wanting a house, you want three houses. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now the third column is what did Wendy leaving me affect? Well, it affected my relationship with her. It also affected my pride because I thought I was a ladies' man, and now she's left, so I'm not that great of a ladies' man. It affected my material security because Wendy is rich and I'm not. It, so now I, the BMW's gone. I'm driving the Pinto again. <laughs> it affected my emotional security because I want the esteem. I want the the approval of a woman. It makes me feel better, and so on. And, so on. and then the sex. It's affected my sexual agenda and my ambitions so I'm not going to sleep with Wendy anymore and I'm not going to sleep with her maid anymore so a lot of things so this her leaving me has affected me seemingly quite a lot and that's the size of the resentment basically the bigger the threat the bigger the resentment and then all right so I've done those three things and then as I got to the third thing I asked myself you know if I felt like I was harmed by her I say please let me be forgiving she's as sick as me and whatever you know you do this little trick so fourth column, then you ask those questions. Where was I selfish or am I being selfish? Because a lot of time the resentment isn't just in the word. You're using it now. The mental state is using now something if you believe happened 30 years ago to bond you to the sense of self. So I always have my people say, when was I and am I being selfish? Where was I am I being self-seeking? Because you're using imaginary events. The head is now. Yeah. So and then I just answer the question. So after a while, you do enough people, you'll see a pattern. Yeah, you'll see a pattern of how self defeats you. First, you'll see what self is really taking to be important. Like for me, it was this. I realized when I came in AA, they told me you got to be willing to save your your ass instead of your face. But I thought my face was my ass. So my image was very very important. So my, a lot of selfing was around there. A lot of anxiety and resentments were co coagulating around there because it was trying to manage, and it's not a ma it's not managerial quality. Yeah, it can take a life, but it can't govern a life. Yeah. So, so I saw that, and then after a while, you see the patterns, and then it's, all right. So now I see how self defeats you, me. And I share it with another person, and that illuminates it even more. And now suddenly, I'm walking around. I'm sober in a life. And I'm going to meetings, I'm keeping a little bit of a balanced condition. And then when I see the selfing arising, I can see it. Yeah? When it's happening. Not like a forensic eunuch three years after, but actually see when it's trying to formulate the story to grab me to make an action. And when you see it, you have a possibility of being free from it. And that brings me right to step six and seven, which is when you see it, it's not your job to try to manage its disposal or its reconfigurement. It's your job to say, hey, I'm, in, I'm entirely ready for this to be removed. It's so be it. Yeah? And then humbly ask that power to remove it. And that's six and seven. Yeah? Then eight, you basically go back to the four steps, see what happened, who you owe amends to. And if there's other things you did that weren't captured in it, you write them. And then step nine is you become willing to make the amends. Once you do four through nine, that's what gives the weight to the third step. Most people who are singing the praises of the third step start singing it really after step nine. They're not singing at the third step. Right there at the, at the third step or before, it's still SOS. They just need fucking help. But now there's some power behind it, and then it starts to becoming a real, real principle in your life. Yeah? That you actually have the ability and the power to turn something over to the care of that power and step out of the outcome business. Yeah? Just suit up and show up. So you do the fears, you do the resentment and the fears, and then the sex is a little different because we're attempting to, to sort of entertain a new ideal about our relationships. So we do the same four c columns, but the fifth column is what, we, what could have we done instead so that we can create a new ideal how I'm going to relate with people, all people, but let's say significant and everything like that. And then we asked for the power to complete that mission, you know. And so that's the fifth step, the fifth column of the sex. So now you've done an inventory process, yeah? which at that point goes right into six, seven, eight, nine. And when that's been done, then 10, 11, 12 is, is the maintenance of the condition now not, that has now been offered to us, yeah. So by doing simple inventories, trying to improve your conscious contact, and to me, the greatest way to improve your conscious contact is to be conscious contact. 
the, pay, the greatest way to improve being awake is being awake. <laughs> it's not working to be awake, just realizing you are awake. It maintains itself beautifully. With no, you, you don't have to wear outfits and get on bicycles. You know what I mean? Sweat. No, it's just always available at all times. <laughs> what more do you want, really? <laughs> and then, now, you've been freed from trying to entertain spirit from the self. You're entertaining spirit as spirit. Yeah? It's like electromagnetism, you know, the electricity produces the magnetism, magnetism produces the electricity. So when they're matched together, it goes on infinitum. Well, the exact same thing. To me, our daily reprieve is contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Well, the highest form of maintenance is to be a spiritual condition. <laughs> because if you're trying to be a spiritual condition as a body, good luck. <laughs> and you can't graft nothing onto something. <laughs> it's going to fluff off. <laughs> That's it. That's the fourth step, I believe. I could go into details, but the point is, this is the biggest point to me. See what you're calling you as foreign. Really, you will not be able to think of getting away from it without it, if you identify as it. And it ain't going anywhere. It's not going to change its stripes. It's just going to feed. If you're in a spiritual environment, it'll feed on you just as if you're on Sixth and Market. Feed on you if you have a lot of tattoos or a loving gaze. It doesn't fucking matter. Because whatever you're seemingly doing, it will use to imply the doer thereof. And I do not believe you can meditate yourself out of the meditator. I do not believe you can do yourself out of the doer. I cannot believe you can think yourself out of the thinker. If you see you're not the thinker, if you see you're not the doer, if you see you're not that, then there's a possibility of relief. Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to end the work this, and then we're go I'm going to go into something else, right? For my own fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we did the AA thing. Now I'm going to do what people were talking about, non-duality. First of all, there isn't anything called non-duality, in my view. Non -du you ever hear of non-duality? Well, you're going to now. <laughs> yes. So, as an introduction, non-duality means not to. Yeah? So basically, it's negating, let's say, the self in us, yeah? In other words, all there is is us. There is no self. So it negates the two, and there's only what we are. And it's never not been that way, and it will always be that way. So the self is an imagination actually being produced by what we are. Because when, what real, when reality thinks something is real, it will seem as real as real can be, yes? So the non-duality, to me, dawned on me, I don't know what happened, but it brought a lot of illumination to the program, the 12-step program. A lot of illumination. It does, it's not a path to illumination, that's AA in a way, but it illuminates the path. Yeah? In other words, you now see that you're the light that you used to be looking for. All right? So non-duality, I, I, like, I just need to get into it. So non-duality is not two non-duality. And what is the basis, the basic point is the same as we were talking about in AA. AA is one of the greatest primers for non-duality. <clears throat> because we have, it's like, you ever see that Fight Club movie where at the end he realizes by looking at a video it was just him the whole, the whole time? Mm -hmm. Like in AA it says we manufacture our own misery and it says sometimes slights fancied or real can kill you. So you have to see your role in things. So if a f fancy thing that never happened could lead you to kill yourself, obviously you are one powerful mofo <laughs> that you can make something out of nothing to cause you such a deep disappointment that you would take your life. That's a power, yeah? So the non-duality is basically that there is no sense of a long-lasting, independent, separate entity. So, but the beautifulness of this is it bypasses the idea of self trying to get out of self. You actually look at self, yeah? And then there's a negation of that, and then you find out what you are, yeah? And what you find out, what you, when you find out what you are, what you are is what you've been looking for. Or as St. Francis says, or said, he's dead, eh? What, what's looking is what you're looking for. That's what happens, yeah? So now, you are not a goal that you want to arrive at. You are that, yeah? 
and you see that what you thought was noble about searching for yourself is a charade because you can never find what you are. You only have one possibility and that's being what you are. You don't have the possibility of becoming what you are because you're being what you are right now. You're not, you don't have the possibility of blowing it and, lo and losing what you are because that would be the, what you are believing that it can lose what it is. Yeah? There's no escaping of the fact of what you are. And that brings about a, a relaxation you can't produce with 50 Thai massages. <laughs> it's unbelievable because you give up the fucking ghost, literally. And now you never get chipped. You're here completely. Yeah? Completely here, every second of every day. You have never vacated it. You are never uh, trying to arrive there. You realize very clearly, you know that big movement, New Age movement, when they had all those books about getting into, uh, into the moment? So it was the how to get into the moment, you know? So you'd buy the book and read it, and then, then you get the next copy, how to really, really be into the moment. And then you just read half of that and get to the extreme one, how to really, really be in the moment. But it's all predicated on an insane idea that you could be out of a moment. You've never been out of any moment you've ever been in, ever. Yeah? And then, conversely, we're trying to get out of something, self, yeah? we're trying to get out of something that we can never be in. That's the beauty of it. Why do you think self persists? Because you're constantly trying to get out of it. It's your getting out of it that breathes life into it. If, you, if, you're in a, if there's an imaginary place and you plan a huge breakout from that imaginary place, it must seem as real as real can be to you to do all that planning to escape it. That's the bondage of self. Yes, that's the bondage of self. We want to get out of an imaginary place, and the getting out of the imaginary place gives reality to the imaginary place. We're not seeing that, yet it's happening all day. So when you see that, and you stop trying to get out of an imaginary place, and how long would it take to get out of an imaginary place? How long, how much rope do you need to escape an imaginary place? How much, how much food do you need for that trip to escape? None. It's, and how much time would pass? No time. And I'll tell you, if you run into the truth here, it's going to demonstrate one quality, which is timelessness. It's not going to take time to be what it is. It's constantly being what it is. The truth of being isn't developing here. It's completely, be it's completely complete. It's not in a process. It's not in any kind of culmination or crescendo. It's always available at all times. There's no entrance and, and there's no exit. You're it. Right now. So in seeing what you're not, which you can humbly do, because it's your nature, your nature is of seeing. So, and what you can see here is what you're not. I see a body, and I know that's not what you are. As a great Zen master said, whatever can be perceived cannot be perceiving. So we're all out of the equation, every one of us, because you can see this and I can see that. We're out, we're off the game board. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like in one fell swoop, zillions of us are gone. Yeah, because we're acting as if we're the one who's seeing, but we're not seeing. Have you seen a dead body that you used to know? Have you seen somebody you used to know dead, the body? I did. I had a very strong hit of it when I was nine. I had an Uncle Fred who used to give me money at relatives' parties and stuff, and uh, I really liked him, and then he passed away, and we're Catholic, and... They have a wake, an open casket wake. And my mother took me to the funeral and she said, Paul, you want to say goodbye to Uncle Fred? I wasn't really that interested in saying goodbye to Uncle Fred. But she grabbed my hand, brought me over to the casket. And I looked in and I had an instantaneous hit. That ain't Uncle Fred. Without the life in it, it wasn't Uncle Fred. I was mistaking the life that was moving, let's say, through Uncle Fred as Uncle Fred. But when I saw Uncle Fred... Without the life, I knew that wasn't Uncle Fred. That's what's happening here. What's looking is not a thing. 
So it's by seeing what we're not, that's the act of being what we are. And you can rest in that because it's incessantly seeing, that's its nature. It's not doing seeing, it is seeing. Just like consciousness, if you look at consciousness, the base of our experience right now, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, it demonstrates no thought or effort to be conscious, does it? Did you go to a seeing class today? Like, you know, you saw, if I get pictures of saints, I see better, whatever. It's not. Have you, are you practiced touching? Is you want your touch better? I gotta get my touch better. So I think it's a little off. I think you're touching much better than I am. Of sensing feeling. None of it. It's never demonstrated any thought or effort ever. That's what we are. Why would you believe thought and effort will bring you there to there that demonstrates no thought or effort? We wanna do, we wanna do what's being. That's how arrogant the self is. It wants to be, it wants to do consciousness. It wants to do awareness. It wants to do this when we're being it. It's much more ease and more relaxation. And also, it's totally reliable because it never goes anywhere, because it's not based on your whims and fancies. You're thinking you're far away from it, hasn't moved you one inch from it. And you're thinking you're getting closer to it, hasn't changed anything. We are like that sky, a big freaking sky. And you know what? Has the sky ever turned into a cloud? After millions of clouds have gone in it, did it ever turn into a cloud? No. When the rain hits, does it wet the sky or does it wet the earth? Have you ever heard a report, a pilot, a pilot called the tower, said he ran into a big chunk of sky? No. The sky allows... Fourth of July explosions every day won't rip the sky open. The sky allows everything to appear in it, yet it's never affected by any of it. That's what we are like. All the heinous things that I thought this did left has left no mark on what you are. Not one. Ever. Not even a henna tattoo. Nothing. <laughs> Why sell yourself so short? Why try, keep trying to be free as a self? Why not just entertain what's said in the book, a freedom from the bondage of self? And the only way that can actually stabilize is you have to see it as not you. If you keep seeing it as you, the best you can have is an experience here and there. Yeah. For the, the, that, that statement, the problem not, does not exist for you anymore. For that to stabilize, it has to go to the problem does not exist as you anymore. That's how it goes. So, that's the humble presentation. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We can have questions. Any questions? Is fine. Questions? Fine. I'm only in Brooklyn today, so whack away. What? Saint Francis. What's looking is what you're looking for. Thank you. So now, yeah. <laughs> we're all in the state of what's looking. Yeah, that's what you're looking for. It doesn't say who's looking is what you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> when we found that, we try to get out of it every day, so obviously it's not what you're looking for. It's who's looking. What's looking? It's what you're looking for. It's not a thing, obviously. A what is, you know, yes. Yeah. Also, the self. Oh, this died, eh? I didn't turn it on. Is this on? I hope so. Yeah, oh, thank you. Huh? Yes, my only job, and I fail every day. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's, what's the question? The self is, like you said, a parasite. It's just a program. It's, it's an not, activity. It to for, it to, it, for it to seem to be so alive, you have to be under its sway. You know, because you have to believe you're it, really. It cannot animate the puppet. You do. It just says the story. It tells you it's true. It implies it's true. But what makes it seem so true is you're believing it. Yes, for sure. If that's abstained from, like in AA, we have abstinence. Well, abstinence is, doesn't stop just at drinking and using. It can be abstinence of thoughts, 
absence, you don't partake in feelings as yours? Yes. And you have an immunity to what's not happening because you know what's happening, because you are what's happening. Don't believe me. Put it to a test. See the next time you do an inventory, if you see it as something other that you don't feel more spacious. And if that happens, you're on to something. Let it continue. Check it out. There is that great statement AA you're not going to escape from. Self cannot get out of self. So you better have you better realize if you're a self or not. Because if you don't, you may be right in that little Chinese thumb torture, self trying to get out of self. It may explain all of your efforts, that little statement, if you can just be honest and see. Are you in the process of self trying to get out of self? And didn't our wonderful book say, or the people who have been around it, self can't get out of self? How are you going to make sense out of that statement while you keep trying to get out of self? If you believe the statement self can't get out of self, you've got to look at this whole thing in a new light. Because if it feels like it, if the fit shoe fits, wear it. If that's what seems to be happening, hopefully this will pr promote a pause so maybe something can be rearranged. Maybe you can, it could work in a way. How it worked with me is when I saw I wasn't that, I could entertain being free from it. And that showed me that I had been entertaining being free as it all the other time. And that's why nothing ever really happened. Yep. Yeah. So how do you, um, I don't really know how to phrase this question. How do you view like 12-step work or service work? It's not getting out of self. I view it, if, I view self, it so. as necessary yeah. for the action figure. What you are doesn't need a, need a way of light. What you think you are needs a way of light. Because this is in time. So it can be, look at what happens, you know. Let's say you're at a retreat and everything's beautiful. You get fed every day. No bills are coming in. You know, can't call anyone up. It's beautiful. You're getting massaged and everything like that. And then Sunday morning you hit the point. Everything is perfect at 9 o'clock. But 9.02 shows up and everything changes. See, this is the dilemma the blocks that you try to get aligned is in a volatile situation called circumstances and situations and time. They change. And, they're, the block, and, then you have to, and so your managing is constantly just trying to keep the blocks in line. It's like trying to build the sandcastle with the tides. It's not going to work. Yeah. You need to be able to outshine your circumstances and situations, and you will not be able to if you're a circumstance in a situation. You have to see something else. That's what, you are what you're looking for. You are the light you are seeking. Right now, it's just being misdirected by the mental state. And what it does is it takes that light and turns it on its little object, and you're obsessed with you. You know what? If today, if the sun was out, everybody would be enjoying the sun. But if, if that sun got magnified to a point, it would incinerate a person. The same light that gives everyone a sense of, ah, great, if it was magnified. The mental state is magnifying a great power of what you are and training it on a mental fucking image and the body that represents it. This does not do well as the center of the universe. This is like a half-ton pickup. You cannot put five tons on it. Yeah? If you take yourself to be this, it's going to be an urban renewal project for the rest of your life. You're going to be reviewing it. I could have done that better. I should have done and on. The greatest day for my body in this life was when I was realized I wasn't the body. It, had the, it was like fucking you know, Independence Day. Yeah? Because this giant mental head got up, and then it could fart and do this. And you become more of an individual when you're not an individual. You're allowed just to be what you are because you're not. If you take this to be you, you're going to want to change it. It's not enough. Constantly. All that money, all that attention, interest into a dead preoccupation. It's all obsession with self. You're trying to, if you go and try to study about obsession with self, that could become obsession with self. Self can't get out of self. It's that simple. And if you don't believe me, believe the book that everyone sometimes thinks is so great, and I believe it is. But I sometimes get sick, man. You know, read the book, see it. 
See what it says. The book isn't about a dogmatic way of life. It's about freedom from the bondage of self. And you do that by finding a relationship with that higher power. And if you do, you may find out it's you that you're in finally in relationship with. That you are the higher power. So I have like, some things will go through in my mind. So in the beginning, I was very confused. Um, so you, you were saying in the beginning, Paul, that if I was getting it right. So a lot of times we think self as a noun. Yes. I am self. So, but you're saying that self is really a verb. Yes. And so you had me thinking, and then I was thinking, um, Marianne Williamson's her of fear of, um, you know, uh, we're not afraid of our fear of our uh, inadequacies. We're really a fear of that we will shine. And that's what you just brought me to. So I'm not so afraid of my inadequacies. I'm very uncomfortable with them because I had lived them all my life. You know, that's who I was, you know, inadequate, all of that. So it's really that fear of that shine. You kept saying that word, shine, shine. But there's no one who has that fear of the shine. When the, when the fear is believed, it implies someone having the fear. If it's not believed as yours, there's just fear of the shine. There's no one who has the fear. That's the relief of the bondage of self. The relief of the bondage of self is the owning of shit you have nothing to do with all day. Because if you own something, in a sense it owns you, as we well know, right? If you own a thought, it can ruin your vacation. Yes, that's abstinence. That's what abstinence is. You came in as a beggar, you leave as a beggar. You have nothing, you've never got anything, and you find that nothing is everything. Yeah? What you are is what you've been looking for the whole time. That's right. But the problem is, your looking has been directed outward when it's truly just recognizing the other seeing. And you can't do that. You have to see what you're not. Then there's a recognition that you're the seeing. If you try to recognize yourself as the seeing, that's what you're not trying to recognize the seeing. When you recognize what you're not, that's cut out. Now there's the seeing. And then you find out what you are. That's how it show, was shown to me. You cannot approach it. This is like a bumper shot in pool. You can't hit the ball directly, so you got to do a ding, ding, yeah? Yeah, so seeing what you're not is the seeing of, that's what you are. You're the seeing of what you're not, yeah? And if you're in AA, how much love is in AA? How much is there? You know, when you're having a hard time, you get to ask to speak a lot. You see, it's always offering us to get out of self. There's love. Sometimes we don't like it because it's going to be uncomfortable, but it doesn't give a shit because it's love. It knows what's best, and it's going to bring it out of us. It is. I haven't seen that in any other groups. There's a lot of grace in recovery, a huge amount. And I've been involved with a lot of different groups on speaking levels. There's nothing like the, the AAA program. Nothing. It's a way of life. You know, one, a church has like one meeting a week. We have 700 meetings a week. AA knows what it's up against. It's up against a fucking very powerful parasite that disguises itself in clear sight because you call it you. That's what we're up against, yeah? Yeah, so, yeah, so stoked to be here in Brooklyn. I used to live in Brooklyn, yeah, but I never was near a penthouse. <laughs> Though the jail had a good view. <laughs> but I used to live in Park Slope near Prospect Park.